then I'll turn it over to uh, Colossians chapter 3. And we're just going to jump right into it today. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to look at the first four verses while you're getting there. I just want to talk to you for a moment. So I've entitled today's message, It's the Day After Christmas, What Now? So, you've opened all the gifts, you cleaned up the mess, hopefully. The family has gone back to their homes. So the question becomes, what do we do now? Studies have shown that the day after Christmas is psychologically one of the worst days of the year. People are disappointed because they did not receive the gifts they wanted. I'm sure none of us are that way. Family has left, and there's a feeling of emptiness. The house is quiet. <laughs> a huge factor in this problem is all the hype leading up to the day and then the day doesn't live up to the hype you see the real issue is that folks forget what this time of year is really supposed to be about in the first place so we get all hyped up about the presents, about the decorations, about all this stuff. We get the focus on ourselves instead of on Jesus. We focus on getting the right gift and on giving the right gift instead of being the right person. The problem is we set our affection in the wrong direction. But the good news is you're here today and today I am a good news preacher, all right? I'm not going to be a Debbie Downer like I was before. You say, sure, Pastor. <laughs> no, really. I am, I am going to be a good news preacher today. And I'm going to help you to reset your affection in the right direction. I'm going to have you looking up when you go walking out of this building today. That's good news. Because today we're going to be looking at four things from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. So let's read the passage, and then we will get started. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So there's four things that we want to look at here. that we need to get in our hearts that will help us to focus, that will help us to set our affection in the right direction. There's actually just four words. Just four words. Seek, set, see, and celebrate. Seek those things which are above. Set your affections, your affection, singular, not affections, affection on things above. See your present life the way God does. And celebrate your future. It's glorious. It's glorious. 
So we start out with verse 1, where it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. Father, we do thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you this morning, Lord, for this passage of Scripture here that we're about to break into. And Father, I pray that you would open all of our hearts, open all of our minds, Lord. Help us to see what you have for us this morning. And Father, I pray that as your word goes out, Lord, that it would go out with power and with authority. And Father God, I pray that Jesus Christ is lifted up and glorified in everything that is said here this morning. And that he gets all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So verse 1 says, seek those things which are above. So what are those things that we need to be seeking? The first thing that comes to my mind is the throne of God. That speaks of our relationship. Look with me if you would in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 14 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Where it says, See then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Seek those things which are above. Another of those things that are above is our future dwelling place. Look with me in John chapter 14. I know I forgot to mention to you, you're going to be looking at a lot of scripture this morning, so there's your warning. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 4, very familiar passage of scripture. John chapter 14 and verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Look at verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know. It goes on in verse 6. It says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We have a future dwelling place in the Father's house. I want you to notice in verse 2 that Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. And then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And so I hear people all the time say, Man, it's a good thing that Jesus was a carpenter's son because he's going to heaven and build me a home. No, he's not. Your home's already built. He's telling his disciples, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. He had to take his blood sacrifice to heaven to prepare a place for us in heaven. It has nothing to do with building you a house. I mean, read your Bible. 
My goodness. Okay, I'm done with that. I told you I was going to be a good news preacher today. That's the good news. Your house is already built. You don't have to wait on Terry to come along and build it for you. That's a good thing. There we go. He said that. I didn't. I just repeated it so that everybody could hear. All right. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verses 14 and 15. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We're in the family. And our family has a house. And in the house, there's many mansions. And our Father is on the throne. And so is our Redeemer, Christ Jesus, our Lord. We need to set our affection on things above. We need to seek those things which are above. Do you know, I know most of you do because I've said this before, I'm just going, going to show it to you. Go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Verse 27. So we need to, to seek those things which are above, which is the throne of God, but we could come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need, and that's where we get our help. I mean, people come to me and they say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm having a problem with this, and I'm having a problem with that, and I'm glad you come to me. But you know where I'm going to take you? To the throne of grace, because there isn't a thing in the world I can do for you, except point you to Jesus. So we need to seek those things which are above. We need to seek that throne. We need to look forward to our dwelling place and the fact that we are in the family of God and that we have a future re residence. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27. It says, And there shall in no wise enter into it, speaking of the, of the city, that great city of God. And it says that, that uh, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but look at this. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only ones that's going into the city of our God is us. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And nobody else. And that is already prepared for us. The golden streets. The pearl gates. The whole thing. We need to seek those things which are above. See, those things, in my mind, are, are pretty exciting. I mean, <clears throat> we seek after promotions at work. You know what promotions at work do for you? They get you more work. Exactly. My boss, and, and, and I have a good boss. I like you guys. But he told me one time, he goes, I'm always, I keep everything real close to my chest because I'm always afraid somebody wants my job. And I said, my friend, look me in the eye and believe what I'm telling you. I wouldn't have your job. I want mine, and I'm going to do everything I can to do my job the best I can to help you do your job. I wouldn't have your job. Relax. And I meant it with all my heart. I want to seek those things which are above, not the things on this earth, because they bring nothing but trouble. And so I find it pretty exciting that the Bible tells us to seek those things 
And it tells us what some of those things are. And it tells us that it's what our Father desires for us. You know what we are? In reality, we are trust fund babies. Oh, yes, we are. We put our trust, listen to me, we put our trust in Jesus Christ. We become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that God has put all things under his feet. He's possessor of heaven and earth. We are trust fund babies if we put our trust in the right place. I thought sure I'd get an amen out of that. So verse 1 says, Seek those things which are above. Where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. Christ, the anointed of God. I want to point something out to you as we get deeper into this. That was what they call a teaser. You gotta hang on, you gotta wait for it. Look at verse two. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. If you're seeking those things which are above, should not your affection already be set? Paul's putting some emphasis here in verse 2 on verse 1. He said, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And then he goes, set your affection. Singular. Because when you start looking at the things on earth, you have affections, plural. And then guess what happens? You fail to seek those things which are above. And you start having little issues. And you start thinking, well, you know what? If I just had this or that or the other, then everything would be good. And I'm going to tell you something. You get this or that or the other, but they still aren't good. Because you got your affection set in the wrong direction. You can move. You can go to another city. And guess what happens when you wake up in the morning in that new city? You're there. And so is your problem. Because it's yours. And you didn't take it and leave it at the throne of grace. Set your affection on things above so that you will seek those things above. So let me explain to you this phrase to set your affection. <clears throat> it's to think, to have understanding, and to focus your mind. To think, to have understanding, and to focus your mind. To properly, listen, to properly seek those things which are above, you have to set your affection on those things which are above. So you need to think about those things which are above. You need to understand those things which are above. And you need to focus your mind on those things which are above. Why do you think, why do you think that Satan has so many distractions in this world? I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if we could come to church on Sunday morning and we could go out the door in the Spirit? And we could go till Wednesday night in the Spirit with nothing distracting us. 
I mean, there's no bills to pay. Some maniac doesn't try to run over you when you're trying to get into the gas station. You don't fall down the stairs and break your back. <laughs> All those things. Satan would be out of business if it was that way. And I want to tell you, he's alive and well and working in Independence, Missouri. So we have those distractions. So we need to set our affection. We need to think. We need to understand. And we need to focus our mind. I'm going to tell you something. In order to understand, we have to read our Bibles. And we have to study our Bibles. And we have to meditate on our Bibles. Or we're not going to understand what we're to seek that is above. It's that relationship. You can't have a relationship with somebody if you don't understand that somebody. You can't have a relationship with somebody if you don't spend any time with them. You're not going to have a relationship with somebody if you don't think about them every now and then. My second point here is that affection is singular. Our problem is the affections, plural. James 1.8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let me give you an example. A young man begins to seek a wife. He's seeking amongst all the girls. I guess they still do that. And then suddenly, little Miss Wright shows up. Now, now he sets his affection on only one of all those girls. The dude becomes focused. He becomes single-minded. He sent his affection. And he's seeking after that woman with everything he's got. You know what? That's the same way that God wants us to be with him. He wants to be the only one. He wants us to seek only one thing and to focus in only one direction. I seen a thing on Facebook last night from one of my cousins, and it showed a picture of this little bitty kid and a, a, a little guy and a little girl, and the little boy don't have a shirt on, he's got some kind of little heart tattooed on his, on his arm or something, and they're like four years old. And uh, it says, you know, all I ever really wanted was a good motorcycle and a good woman. So I responded. I said, well, I found the good woman. But every motorcycle I ever touched hurt me. <laughs> so I'm telling you, you've got to be focused in the right direction. James in James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above. Look at verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So you're seeking, you're setting, and now you're seeing your position, your present life the way God sees it. How difficult is it for us to see ourselves as dead? But the Bible tells us over and over again that's the way we're supposed to see ourselves. 
if we could get to that point, it would be so much easier to just give up the things that we want, the things that we desire to serve God. As husbands and wives, especially husbands, it would be so much easier for us to give up our desires and our wants and our, our, our cravings and our needs to take care of our wives. God sees us as dead and he tells us to see ourselves as dead in this present world. I want to show you this thing. Look in Romans chapter 6. Keep your place here in, in uh, Colossians. We'll be back. But look at Romans chapter 6. We'll look at the first seven verses. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were baptized, I'm sorry, there's no we in there. Let me start over. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's the way we should see ourselves. We should see ourselves as... Ex do you know that's what you do when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? You are accepting His death, His burial, and His resurrection as your own. He went to the cross for you and for me. That's what Romans chapter 6 is all about. And it talks about being baptized into Him. At the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you were baptized into His death. Water baptism, the thing that we do back here, the water baptism is simply your public testimony of what has already happened to you. It has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. It's a public testimony. You were baptized into Jesus Christ at the moment of salvation. And we need to see ourselves as partakers of His death. Because that's our concept. We're going, to, we're going to build on this. We are alive to God in Christ. You should still be in Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So our death is a death unto sin. So, as that chapter started out, why do we still sin if we're dead to it? Well, we don't die very good. That's the problem. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, I'm going to back up to verse 4. It says, But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even 
When we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. So, we were dead in sin, and now we're dead to sin. I like the change. Verse 6 says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? I think that's one of the most wonderful things about our salvation. We was dead in sin, now we're dead to sin. We was stuck here on earth, and now we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Go to Colossians chapter 2. I want to show you how this thing works. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also, watch this, verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Will you guys say it? The Holy Spirit of God. Christ himself. Came and inhabited your soul and your spirit. And performed a circumcision that was made without hands. That's why Paul says over there in Romans chapter 7, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You want to know why you can't die to your sin? Because you still had your flesh. That's our problem, folks. But we've been circumcised. The, the real me, the real you... The real believer is sinless and perfected. Because of the circumcision of Christ made without hands. The flesh is dead. But the spirit is life. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Verse 12 says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were uh, far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, verse 14, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. 
We are one in Christ. chapter 2, that's why. Go to chapter 1, let's read the right thing. <laughs> yeah, it messed me all up. Alright. Okay, let's go to chapter 1 and verse 12, like I said. <laughs> that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first, okay, here we go, yeah, this is reading right, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, this is what I was looking for, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. See how much better it works when you get the right chapter? Man, I'm telling you. All right, go to chapter 4. I'll get it right this time. Chapter 4, look at verse 30. Chapter 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we're in Christ, and we've had the circumcision made without hands. We're separated, the soul and spirit from the flesh, and we're sealed until the day of redemption. And I know I, I've said this before, and I know the people have got upset with me when I've said this before. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we're really only half saved. Our flesh is still a mess. That's why Paul says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's why in Romans chapter 8, he says that the whole, the whole creation... Uh, groans and travail, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. That's why we have so many struggles in this life. Now that's guaranteed, so don't go getting all crazy on me then. Our, the, the redemption of this body is guaranteed. The Holy Spirit is indwelling us. That's our earnest possession, the Bible says. That is our down payment. When, when, when God calls His Holy Spirit out of here, He's taking us with Him. So don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying there. But my friends, our flesh is corrupt. It's as corrupt today as it was the day before we got saved. If we don't put our, our focus and we don't set our affections and we don't see ourselves the way God sees us. That's the only thing that keeps us on the straight and narrow. I'm going to tell you this. A Christian can do everything that a lost person can do except go to hell. Think about it. And a lost person can do everything that a Christian can do except go to heaven. That's the difference. We're all eternal. It's our eternal destination that makes the difference. You can do all the good works as a lost person or as a safe person. As a safe person, there's reward. As a lost person, there's nothing. nothing. So we need to seek those things which are about. We need to set our affection on those things which are done. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. And then we need to celebrate our future. Look at back in, uh, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 4. When 
Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Do you understand that? We've been talking a lot about the fact that we're dead, our flesh. But we're alive in Christ. Why? That verse just told you, because Christ is our life. That's where our focus needs to be. We're going to be with Jesus forever. The stuff on this earth is temporal. We're going to be with Jesus forever. Look at 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. Beginning in verse 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There is no more beautiful passage of Scripture, I don't believe, anywhere in the Bible than that passage right there. Oh, what a comfort to know that those, those brothers and sisters in Christ, those family members that are in Christ, when that trumpet sounds, when Jesus breaks through and, and, and that trumpet sounds and you hear the, the trump of God and the voice of the archangel and we get caught up in the clouds together, we're going to meet in the clouds. And we're going to be with the Lord forever. It doesn't get any better than that. That's a promise of God. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two verses eleven through thirteen. Second Timothy two eleven. It is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Folks, we have a glorious future. But that glorious future can be even more glorious. Look at what it says. Verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. Same verse. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Has nothing, get this down, has nothing what so ever to do with your salvation. The very next verse 
says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, where are you? You're in Christ. He cannot deny himself, but he can certainly deny your reign if we refuse to suffer with him. He says, I don't believe that. Well, go to Romans chapter 8. I knew he's going to say that. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We like that one, don't we? Verse 17. And if children, then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Man, there's that suffering thing again. So, Jesus goes to the cross and He suffered our sin upon Him and we have the audacity to think that we should live in Him and suffer nothing for Him? It's crazy. It's crazy. And then, we're going to get to heaven having done nothing on earth, and we're going to get to heaven, and we're going to reign with Him? You better read your Bible. That's not going to happen. I'll tell you something else. Look at this verse again, verse 17 of Romans 8. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, my Bible says, if, if, so be that we suffer with Him. So we're not asked to suffer alone. He's in us. When we're suffering, we're suffering with Him. But I'm going to tell you something. Look at what this verse says. Look at what it says. If so be that we suffer with Him, look at this, that we may be also glorified together. Oh, you want the glory. You want the rain. But let me get out my pen knife and cut out this suffering thing because we don't want that. I want to tell you something. You are not going to have the rain. I am not going to have the rain. We are not going to have the rain. We are not going to have the glory if we won't do the suffering. If we do, then God's a liar. And my Bible very clearly says that God cannot lie. It's a serious thing. Verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You willing to suffer for the glory of Christ? In you. Think about it. I had a guy tell me the other day, he goes, well, you know, you're, you, you just have that easy, easy believism. I said, oh, no, I don't. I believe that salvation is very easy. You believe the word of God. And my friend, the Christian life, if it's easy, you ain't living it. So we need to celebrate our future. It's a glorious one. But we determine how glorious it is. Now I gotta I gotta just tell you this straight out. I would be much happier being in heaven having no reward than being in hell gathering that reward. But I don't want to be in heaven having no reward. And I don't want you to be in heaven having no reward. I want us to go to heaven and to reign with Christ. 
and to be glorified with Him. But we've got to put out a little effort here. Let's wrap this thing up. I'm going long. So you see, folks, in Jesus, we have everything. The question is what are we doing with what we have? I want, to, I want to remind you of something that I find amazing in my closing statement today. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, past tense, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. I want to stop right there for just a moment because I told you I was going to give you a little tidbit this morning. In our passage of Scripture, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, there's not one time where you see the name Jesus. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ. Here's why. Jesus is the name of the man that came and died on the cross for you and me. Christ is the anointed of God. If Jesus, now, now listen, this is important. This is important Bible doctrine to understand. If Jesus doesn't fulfill totally everything that God sent him to do, he is not the Christ. If he is not the Christ, we are not seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have to keep our doctrine straight. Jesus could have denied the Father. He did. And he wouldn't. And God knew he wouldn't. But he wasn't the Christ until he fulfilled everything. Now he's the Christ. He's the anointed of God. Matthew chapter 28. This one just came into my head, so I got to I got to find it. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 17 says, And when they saw him, speaking of Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. When Jesus came back, after he went to heaven, and prepared a place for us, he come back, and he said, all power is given unto me. I'm the Christ. I'm the anointed of God. I'm, on my, I'm going to be on my throne in heaven. Now you can come boldly to the throne of grace. Keep it straight. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ. We're the children of God in Christ. See, you and I got everything at the moment of salvation. God held back nothing from us. It's like Terry was showing Ollie this morning. He went down to give him the gifts, and I was sitting back in the back. I couldn't see what it was. And then he kept pulling out more stuff and giving it to me. That was a good picture of what God did for us. He gave us everything. Not just our redemption. Not just our justification. He gave us everything. It's 
why in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says you are complete in Him. You and I have it all. Or at least we had it all given to us. But see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Your works might get burned up, but you're not going to. Amen. I praise God for that. So, what rewards do you stand to lose? We've already, we've already seen some. You lose your reign. You lose your glory. But as they say in the infomercials, Wait, that's not all. When you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, you receive five crowns. Five crowns. Crown of righteousness, the incorruptible crown, the crown of life, the crown of glory, and a crown of rejoicing. You can retain those crowns, and you can lose those crowns. It's up to you. It's up to me. I got the same problem. I can keep it, or I can lose it. Depending on how I live my life. Depending on how I live my life in Christ. Seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above. Wouldn't it be a shame to have everything and lose it? We've been given the greatest gifts from our heavenly Father. We need to hold on to them. We need to cherish those things. We need to set our affection in the right direction. Set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Where Christ set up on the right hand of the Father. Isn't it funny that we're told to do that? Even though, in reality, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Think about it. Why do we have to be told to have our affection, to have our, our hearts set? on God when we're seated at the throne of God. I'll tell you why. Because we don't understand it. We don't grasp what God has done for us. And I know that there's probably some that are hearing this message and they've never accepted Jesus Christ and that offer of salvation. God's invitation into His family. Find yourself in that particular group today. Right now, right now, would be the perfect time to resolve that problem. See, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, We then, as workers together with Him, speaking of Christ, beseech you, also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day 
of salvation. Here's how you make that happen. It's very simple. Salvation is the simplest thing that a person can do. So here's the thing, folks. If you've, been, if you've heard this message and you've been paying any attention at all, you know that what I said is the truth. You know it. I know that because that is the Holy Spirit of God's job. Is when the Word of God goes out, the Bible says that God's Word goes forth and it accomplishes that which He sent it to do. If you heard the message, you know you need Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Folks, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it's really simple. The first thing, admit you're a sinner. We all know that. I mean, even as Christians we sin. So you know that without Jesus, you're a sinner. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. So admit you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And then just call on Jesus. So I know I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. And I want you to come into my heart, into my life, and save me. Right now. It's that simple. Please. And don't think, don't be listening to this and, and, and watching this and say, well, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. I know what Paul had done. And God saved him and used him mightily. I'm going to tell you something else. I know what I have done. And God saved me. And he's using me. And I know something else. The Bible says in that same chapter of Romans, chapter 10, and verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't have anything to do with what you've done. It has everything to do with what you do right now. Ask Jesus into your heart. Confess your sin to him. Repent of your sin. Repentance, people get all tied up on it, but it's a very simple thing. It's simply a change of direction. Change your direction. Quit following Satan. Start following Jesus. It's that easy. Christians, we need to be praying. We're wrapping up a year here as a church. We're going into next year. And I'm working on next year. God has been working with me on next year. After the first of the year, we will have a time of enlightenment, if you will. I'm going to share the vision for the upcoming year and where we're going as a church. And uh, we will move forward from there. But between now and then, we have a responsibility. We have the responsibility to take the word of Christ to a lost and dying world. We have the responsibility to suffer for Jesus. If we won't, we cannot expect to win. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. Father, we do thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for this passage in Colossians chapter 3. Lord, what, a, what an awesome passage to get us to set our focus, to look in the right direction, to set our affection, to seek those things which are above, to see ourselves the way that you see us, Lord. And Father, to understand to understand the glory, the glory that we have in Jesus Christ. And, oh, Lord, the glory that we can have 
if we just apply ourselves to living the godly life that you saved us to live. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Help us that when we come to the judgment seat of Christ, that we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. Lord, in this time of the year, we've been celebrating his birth. Father, that birth had to take place to fulfill scripture. It had to take place so that he could live a life, a sinless and perfect life, so that he could go to the cross and take my sin and the sin of the whole world to the cross with me and crucify with me. Oh God, we thank you so much for that. Lord, I just pray that we will not lose our focus, that we will understand the meaning that we have established on this time of the year not knowing when he was born, but Lord God, knowing for sure that he was born. Help us to be faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.